Normally when I'm looking for something to recreate, I tend to focus on websites, but this time I stumbled across something a little different and also incredibly cool. This channel is called Project JDM, and he's recently been blowing up for creating some super mesmerizing audiovisual animations, some of which form what are called polyrhythms. I could try to explain what that means, but I think it'd be easier if you just take a listen. Here we have 21 arcs. On each arc is a circle. When the animation begins, all of the circles are completely in sync, but the angular velocities of each circle are staggered such that the innermost circle is the fastest and the outermost is the slowest. Even by the time the first circle gets to the other end of its arc, the paths of all the circles have already significantly diverged. When a circle makes contact with either end of its arc, it plays a sound which on its own is not really very interesting. But when all of them are played in sequence, it actually sounds pretty nice. As time goes on, the circles diverge more and more, ending up in what appears to be a completely chaotic mess. But the interesting thing about this rhythm, and what makes polyrhythm so special, is that eventually, out of that chaos, they begin to find order once again. Not only that, but after a period of time, they actually perfectly resynchronize back at the starting point. After seeing all this, I decided I have to have one. So let's go to our browser and type in pen.new. When we land on CodePen, we're going to need to be able to do a few things. We need a way to draw a line, a circle, and an arc. Then we need a way to space 21 copies of our arc and our circle evenly across our line. We then need to animate our circles around our arcs in such a way that they're staggered and yet somehow still resynchronized back at the starting point after a specified time frame. And finally, anytime a circle comes in contact with our line, we need it to play a musical note. Let's start simple with something to draw on. How about a canvas that I'll call paper? Let's make it a big piece of paper, like one that takes up the whole window. We're gonna need something to draw with too, so how about a pen? Then we need a way to list out some instructions on what exactly our pen has to draw. But before we do that, unfortunately, our paper doesn't know we made it bigger over here, so we have to inform it of its new size first. Now we can add our first drawing. Let's think about where we want our line to be. I kinda want it near the bottom of the piece of paper, like 90% of the way down. And I think it should span about 80% of the way across. The nice thing about our pen is that we can make it any color and any thickness. We can tell it we're about to create a new drawing, specify our starting and ending point, and of course all this is just hypothetical thought until we tell our pen to actually do it. Okay, now we need an arc. So let's start another drawing, but this time specify we're creating an arc. Just like we did with our line, let's think about where our arc needs to be. Instead of a starting and ending point though, this time our pen just needs to know where the center is and how big the arc needs to be. Well, we want it to be the same distance down from the top of our paper, but this time we want the X position to be exactly in the center. I don't know how big it should be, so why don't we just figure out the length of our line and make it a small percentage of that? Now it needs a starting and ending angle. What are those supposed to be? Interesting. So basically, these values just let you customize how much of a circle you want. Like a full circle would start at zero and end at 360 degrees. It looks like these values are supposed to be in radians though, which I don't really remember too much about. But it looks like halfway around is pi radians and a full circle is two pi radians. That's easy enough to remember. We just need a half circle, so let's start at zero and end at pi. Well, wait, we want our arc to be on top, so maybe we need to start at pi and end at 2 pi. Amazing. The next thing is drawing a little circle to follow our arc. We already know how to draw a half circle from pi to 2 pi, so let's do the same thing, but this time run it from 0 all the way around to 2 pi. Let's base it on the size of our line again, but this time smaller, like a lot smaller. Oh, and how do we fill in our circle all the way so it's not just an outline? Ah, okay. Set the fill style and fill it in. Neat. Now I know we need our circle to wind up on the arc so it can follow it like a pathway, but I don't have the slightest clue how we're going to get it there or how we're going to get it to move back and forth between this angle and this angle. Is there a way to just find a position of a point on a circle? Oh, here we go. So all I need to plug in here is the center point of the arc, its radius, and an angle. And the formula for that looks something like this. So looking back at our code, here's where we drew our arc, and here's where we 
we drew our little circle. Right now, both our circle and our arc are positioned in the center of our line. But if we wanted to use this fancy new formula to move our circle onto our arc, we need to plug in some values. We already know the center point, and I suppose we can just paste in the radius of our arc. But we still need to figure out what the angle should be. Well, our arc starts at an angle of pi, so let's try plugging that in. Holy hell, I have no idea how sine and cosine work, but I can't believe that I just discovered their first ever real world use case. Okay, so can we just put in whatever angle we want here? Like what if we tried two pi or 1.5 pi? Hmm, so essentially we can move this circle along our arc by literally just changing this number around. That seems pretty useful, but obviously manually updating this number at a rate of a thousand times per second isn't very practical. So we are going to have to figure out a way to do it automatically. The solution to that is actually not as fancy as you might think, because fortunately for us, your computer monitor, the one you're watching this video on, is already updating really, really fast. Probably not quite a thousand times per second, but most likely at least 60 times or maybe more if you have a fancy one. And amazingly enough, all we have to do to access this capability is head down to the end of our drawing instructions instructions, call request animation frame, and pass our instructions inside. And while nothing appears any different just yet, behind the scenes, our entire image is now being redrawn as many times per second as our monitor will possibly allow. Which means that if we keep track of exactly when the page loads and what the current time is, we can now get an update on how much time has passed at an extremely high rate of speed. But how does this help us with our problem at hand, which is moving our angle number up and down? Perhaps it would help to think of this value as a distance. Not a linear distance like 10 pixels this way, 10 pixels that way, but instead as an angular distance. Like the distance from here to here would be 180 degrees or one pi radians. So how might we go about determining a particular distance if all we have is time? Ah, so distance is literally just time multiplied by velocity. Let's go back to our angle for a moment, and why don't we rename it to distance to make things a bit clearer. We know we want our little circles to start on this side, so we set our starting distance to pi. But in order to see how much further our circle has gone, we need to fill out the rest of our new formula. Since we now have access to how much time has passed, we can plug that in, but what should we use for velocity? I'm down to just throw some numbers out there and see what happens. How about five? Whoa, too fast. Okay, better. Wow, so after all of that, we're finally updating our distance number automatically. It's interesting though that even though this number has gone past our max angle of two pi, or roughly 6.28, the circle keeps winding around forever. I guess it makes sense though, because no matter how many degrees you add to an angle, it'll always be a valid one. But we don't actually want it to do that. We kinda need it to uh, ping pong back and forth. I wonder, ah, the modulus operator. So if we take our distance traveled and mod it by the maximum possible angle, what happens? It resets back to zero, but that wouldn't do anything to reverse the direction. It would just prevent the angle from increasing infinitely. What am I missing here? Oh, I see. So now we have two possible ranges. These angles are all above pi and these angles are all below pi. So it looks like we need to adjust our angle to say that if the angle is above pi, don't change anything. But if the angle is below pi, send it back the other way. Ugh, that was a lot of steps we just did. I think I need a quick recap to make sure I'm understanding correctly. First, we drew a plain old circle in the center of our line. We needed to move it onto our arc, so we looked up the formula for finding a point on an arc, which required the radius of the arc and an angle. We could have used any angle we wanted, like 0 or 0 0.5 pi, but instead we used 1 pi because we wanted our circle to start on the left side of the arc. We then realized that we could make our circle move around the arc by simply changing the value of the angle. But doing that manually was tedious, so we used request animation frame to rerun our instructions 60 times per second, which gave us the ability to determine precisely how much time had passed. And since the formula for distance is time multiplied by velocity, we now had a way to automatically update this value and therefore move our circle along our arc. Amazing. But then we realized that since angles can increase infinitely, we had no way to constrain our moving circle between these two points. We then learned that 
that we could leverage the modulus operator to reset our angular distance back to zero each time it reached the max value of two pi, which on its own didn't actually change anything. But now we'd unlock the ability to say that so long as the angle is between pi and two pi, don't change anything. As soon as the angle was reset back to zero, however, instead of using it directly, subtract it from the max angle, thereby sending it back the other way. All right, now I think it's finally time to add some color to our drawing here. If I recall correctly, we need 21 arcs. So I'm gonna find a gradient I like, and I don't know a better way to do it, so I'm gonna tediously manually pick out 21 different colors. Now let's go down to where our arc and our circle are drawn, and instead of drawing just one of each, we need to draw a new pair for each of the colors in our list. We also want each arc to be slightly bigger than the last, so they're not all just sitting on top of one another. Let's try keeping track of the first one size and then incrementing each one from there. Well, maybe a bit more. Okay, there's gotta be a better way to do this. Uh, I want them all to be evenly spaced across the line, so how much space do I have to work with? If this is the center point and the first arc starts here, I guess I technically have to fit all of the rest of them between that point and this point. Well, I know how long the line is, so I think I need to divide it in half, but that's not quite enough because there's still this space here, which is just the radius of the initial arc. So I'll need to subtract that out as well. That gives me the total available space. So in order to distribute it evenly, I'll just divide that amount by the total number of arcs. And now I can replace the arbitrary spacing I used before with the more precise one. All right, my head hurts again. Let's recap that section too. We figured out how to get our first arc and circle combo working, and then it was time to build out the rest of them. So we made a list of 21 unique colors that we could loop through to draw 21 different arcs. But the code to draw our arcs was the exact same for each one, which meant we were just drawing 21 identical arcs on top of each other. So as we looped over each of the arcs, we used the index value, which goes up by one for each arc, to increment the size by a value we randomly picked. That technically worked, but there's no denying it's way cleaner to space them evenly. So we had to calculate how much space we had available between the first arc and the end of the line, so we could give each of them an equal share. Okay, I thought we said something about adding color too. Let's head down to where our arcs get drawn, and instead of white, let's use the color from our list. Phew! I don't know how we did it, but it looks like we managed to make our very own silent metronome. But now we have a pretty interesting problem to tackle. We need to stagger the velocities of each of our circles, which is actually pretty straightforward. I mean, just like how we use the index to add to the radius of each arc, we can subtract a little bit from the velocity of each circle as we loop through them. And yes, that means we get some staggered circles, but one of the coolest things about the original is that all of the circles managed to realign after exactly 15 minutes have passed. So yeah, we've got some circles moving around, but I have no idea if or when they'll ever realign. Maybe we need to take another look at how we're calculating our velocity in the first place. Back when we found the formula for distance, we kind of just plugged in a random number for velocity that made the circles move at what seemed like a reasonable pace. But I don't think a random velocity is gonna work anymore. We need to be a bit more precise. Oh, duh. The formula for velocity is just the formula for distance rearranged a bit. Okay, I want the whole realignment thing to take just as long as the original, so I'm gonna use a time frame of 15 minutes or 900 seconds. But now I'm not sure what to use for distance. Let's see, we know this is the exact point they need to realign at, so I guess the shortest distance to get back here would be one pi that way and one pi this way for a total of two pi. Let's go ahead and plug that number in and uh, that's ridiculously slow. Oh, because it's literally gonna take the whole 15 minutes to get from here all the way around and back to here. So essentially, I can get all of the circles to do one full loop in exactly 15 minutes. Well, can I get them to do two full loops? Yes. What about 50? There we go, that's a pretty good pace. What does that mean though? I can just set this number to whatever I want, and because of a magical formula for velocity, they'll always end up back at the starting point after whatever time frame we put here. That's insane. Wait, wait, wait. So if it doesn't matter what this value is, so long as it's a whole number, why couldn't it be different for each circle? I mean, I think I can just use the index again to subtract one each time. So the inner circle would be the fastest at 50 loops every 15 minutes, and the outermost circle would be the slowest, completing only 30 loops every 15 minutes. Let me make sure I'm getting this right. 
Before all of this, we were using a hand-picked velocity of 0.5 and reducing it by a small amount for each circle, which certainly looked like it was supposed to, but then we realized the only way we were going to get these things to realign precisely back here was by somehow calculating the perfect velocity for each one to make that happen, which sounds like an insane timing problem to solve, but because we already knew our total duration and distance was literally just the number of loops back and forth, we already had everything we needed to fill out this formula. And the best part was that no matter how many loops we assigned to each circle, because the time value was the same for all of them, they'd always realign exactly as expected. All right, I'm no musical expert, but I am pretty resourceful. Ooh, what's this? Oh, I can dig it. How's this work? Record. Okay, cut it down to like two seconds long. Export. Only 20 more to go. Neat. Okay, back to CodePen. Upload all. How's the audio API work again? Oh, that's easy. Why don't we just loop over our list of colors and instead of returning just the color, create a new audio file and return that along with it. Oh, and as a pre-warning, please set the volume to like 0.02 to make sure you don't accidentally go deaf like I almost did. Now, we need to play an ARC's audio file anytime it touches the line. But how do we know when that happens? What if we mod the distance by pi? Then we could just play the file anytime that number hits zero. Huh, I guess we can't count on it ever perfectly hitting zero. Maybe we could use time instead. What's the formula we keep having to use? Let's rearrange it a bit. Okay, so assuming any given circle just made contact with the line, let's call that say current impact time. In order to determine when it'll hit again, we'd need to know how far it'll have to go, which is one half loop, and how fast it's going, which we already figured out before. And that means we can find the first impact time when we're loading in our arcs using the overall start time and the velocity of the arc which I suppose means we'll have to move that calculation up here and add it to the arc. Now, I need to warn anyone who's made it this far, before doing the next step, please create a boolean called sound enabled and set it to false. And then back where we draw our circles, we can do the check to see if we've passed our impact time, and most importantly, check if sound is enabled, which since we just set it to false, it will not be. And before we play our audio file, we are going to add another line that disables sound anytime the window gets minimized. Because even though request animation frame stops running if the page is minimized, as soon as you read open it, it will kindly play all of the missed notes simultaneously for your ears to enjoy. So learn from my experience and implement the mute toggle, and then you can just make it so clicking the screen enables sound. Kind of annoying, but worth it. So with that, we can safely play our audio file and get the next impact time. And now you're free to customize your polyrhythmic animation however you want. You don't even have to keep it as a half circle. You can change the instrument, you can change the colors. You can even make an hour-long version and upload it to YouTube for the world to enjoy.